this morning. We'll have a few come in here uh, in a little bit. So we're going to start just so I can give myself a full opportunity to get through the lesson. It's a joy to be with you today as we continue our study in Revelation. We're moving right along. And today we're going to look at the first six seals. Now, in these first six seals is the four horsemen of the apostles. And it's quite interesting. And uh, I look forward to sharing with you God's word. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank and praise your holy name that you are over all things. That even in these gray and latter days, your church need not fear. For you have all things in the palm of your hand, and you will bring it to completion. So as we study your word, prepare our minds, our hearts, may we have ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, here we go. I, I found this lovely picture. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, let's kind of uh, jump into like a little overview here, because it really helps us, because now we're getting into this revelation, uh, this uh, um, proper, the, pro pro the, uh, the prophecy proper, and let's just do a little bit of review. We're dealing with apocalyptic literature, okay? So there's things that are spoken that um, might seem odd and strange. We're really dealing in a lot of symbolism, okay? So as we go through this, we're going to see things that present itself as stuff we're used to. Like people on horses. Well, what does that mean? And then what does it mean when they have like six heads, 50,000 eyes, and all this other stuff, and it's creepy and stuff? Well, we're going to dive in. When it talks about earthly events, earthly events, so there's going to be, in this prophecy, things that pertain, that are symbols that really come from everyday things. Okay? Everyday things. Well, are portrayed by symbols taken from human and earthly life. So when it's taken from human earthly life, it pertains to things that happen on the earthly realm. Okay? On the earthly realm. When they portray symbols that go beyond human experience and intelligence, such as the multiple heads and the multiple crowns and all of that, we're dealing in the supernatural. There's supernatural events. So there's really... It, it really helps us to distinguish between things, earthly events and supernatural events. Okay? Just to recap, earthly events are going to have symbols that really come from and are seen in everyday human activity. Supernatural events are going to kind of be a little weird, a little more chaotic, a little strange, and it goes beyond human experience and intelligence. Okay? Is that clear? Somewhat? Clear as mud, as my Greek professor used to say? Yeah. Well, we'll see it here in a minute. Because when we're dealing with the four horsemen, when you read that, they're guys on horses. And they have things that we can grasp in our everyday world of swords. A balance. Now, we don't typically use balances now, but they did a lot in the olden days. The balance is this thing where you, you can set weights and, and gold and it balances and to, to figure out what it costs. So one of them has that. Well, what we're going to see as it, when we go through the horsemen, it's going to pertain to earthly events. Earthly events. <coughs> Uh, so, the, these seals introduce woe and tribulation. And what we're going to see is that they frequently, 
experience in this fallen world. So the things that we do in the New Testament are what has already been experienced in our world today. Okay? We're going to see this natural opposed to supernatural. There's kind of a battle there. And really what's going on is that the Lord uses these things as a judgment against human sin. Okay? We really have to understand that the Lord does not like sin. Why? Because sin cannot dwell in the presence of God. And who does God want to dwell with? Us, who are sinful. So he does something about it. And he actually desires people to come to faith. And he uses things to bring about repentance. Sometimes he has taken me and brought me to absolute nothing. So that finally is. And he used the hard times to bring me to nothing. Jack's heart, I, I haven't shared this with you guys, but um, when Jack was in the hospital fighting for his life, there was a point where I had a yelling match at God, and it was one way. <laughs> Maybe you've been there. And I remember, I was at the Ronald McDonald house. I needed to shower because I had to shower for a couple days. And I was just pouring everything out that I had. And the Lord brought me to complete brokenness. Because there's nothing I could do for my son. And the Lord took my anger, stopped it like that, and in that moment, I realized in life or in death, blessed be the name of the Lord. I was brought through this circumstance to a point where I had to fully and completely depend on the Lord. Sometimes the Lord does that. Okay? Now we do have to understand, and this is hard to comprehend, but a lot of us, everything that goes on is under the Lord's permissive will. Did God afflict my son with a heart condition? No. I'm going to argue no. But do we live in a broken world where sin happens and heart conditions take place? Yes. And did the Lord allow that for a purpose? Yes. Do I fully understand it? No, I don't. Same thing with my mother, 60 years old. Doctors knew. They sent her home anyway. She died three weeks later. Unexpected. Am I angry about that? Yes. I am upset still. Do I understand why? No. Does the Lord have a purpose in it? I'm sure he does. And one day I will fully understand that purpose. Do I thank the Lord that my mother is with him and no more pain and suffering? Absolutely. And there's hope in the circumstances. But I have to say that the Lord allowed it to happen for some reason. Now, did I have a one-way argument with the Lord about that? Yes, I did. I did. <laughs> and there's things where I still do. <clears throat> what we're going to see is under God's permissive will. Hard to fathom. But we're viewing Revelation through what lens? Christ and his victory. Which is the only way to do it. Because that means there's hope. Okay? Last two seals is kind of it's, it's moving towards hope. Okay? It, it doesn't read that, but it sets up the hope that is to come in chapter 7. Okay? There is hope. Let's keep her moving. Revelation 6, 1 through uh, 2. Now I watch 
And the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering to conquer. Now, white horse crown might smell like Jesus. Here it's not. We get that picture of Jesus later. Okay? This is not. So what is it? Well, the description, white horse, rider holding a bow, bow and arrow, okay? Where's the crown? Symbolizes and represents from every form of tyranny. Oh, I misspelled the word. Don't, don't look at that. Every form of tyranny which is won and acquired by power and force, usually warfare or forms of it, and which then by a dictatorial rule exploits, enslaves, dominates, and terrorizes. So what he's talking about here is this conquering, enslaving kind of thing. We have seen that throughout history, have we not? We have. There's going to be more of it. We're seeing it today. What is happening in Ukraine? Right? What is, what, Taiwan is, is scared. Okay? There's nothing new under the sun. But what the Lord is telling us here is that this horseman is this searching for power to conquer other nations. Okay? It's happening. It's happening. Let me just make sure I have all that I want to share with you. Okay? Uh, it can take the classical form of triumphant militarism and the lust of con conquest which makes great empire. However, it also refers to any human entity institutional or individual, lawful or unlawful, which misuses its authority to exert tyranny over its subjects. It can be governmental, educational, or economic system, a spouse, parent, or any personal agent in authority in any sphere of life. Sphere of life. Such tyranny often justifies its dominance by claim of divine or quasi-divine authority, hence the horse color is white. It gives a terrifying depiction of how human beings treat each other. People of inhumanity to, off to other people through fear and exploitation. Okay? It's happening. We're already experiencing it. We're not waiting for this to happen as the timeline people suggest. Evidence is there. It, it, you see it in human sex trafficking. You see it in conquest of nations. You see it all over the place. And so what are we to do as God's people? Be kind to one another. Care for one another. I was thinking about that. Sitting there, you know, at a hotel this week, and, and there's, you know, people that come in and change all the, the beddings and stuff. People staying usually don't talk to them, do they? I do. <laughs> Holding a door. I actually saw a video where one guy argued that it, it, you shouldn't hold doors for people because it's a waste of time. They calculated all the time you'd be holding doors for people. And I'm like, that's a, like the best use of waste of time. Like this is what the church is supposed to do. We're to live out our faith. The fruits of the Spirit. Peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. All of it. Okay. 
Okay. One there. Three through four. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse, bright red, with its rider permitted to take peace from the earth, so that people would slay one another, and he was given a great sword. Bright red, one might suggest blood red, wields a sword. Well, what's a sword? It's warfare. Symbolizes warfare. Also represents unlawful killing and murder. The destroyer of peace. Peace and tranquility will be the exception. Think about it. When has peace been the rule or the norm? Turn to Matthew or Mark 13. Care. <laughs> didn't even care. 
A day of rejoicing it was. And I grabbed the allotted limit and I ran away. <laughs> yes, that is the heart. Inflation is there. In other countries, you can get one million dollars of their currency and it means absolutely because the currency and the inflation is so bad, it's worthless. And the only way to exchange, I saw a video on this, is through the black market. <coughs> we have seen my great grandparents live through the dust bowl. In Nebraska, it was bad. My grandpa, when he was like 80, late 80, still wash every cup out before drinking. Because of the habit, dust would be everywhere, and so you, you would have to rinse it out. So it shouldn't surprise us when there's these economic ebbs and flows. Okay? And it shouldn't surprise us when things get really bad. And there's scarcity. But well, has God promised though to give us daily bread? Does he not? He does. Okay? Represents family. Oh, the pale horse. This is the horse I don't like. Okay? Let me read that. Seven through eight. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider was named Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, and with famine, and with pestilence, by, and by wild beasts of the earth. Death is the result of tyranny. The bloodshed and the famine of the first three horsemen. And that death together with the grave reigns on earth. Just yesterday, I got the phone call. Peggy hey, had died. Zoomed over there as fast as I could go. Thankfully, everybody else cooperated and got out of my way. When I got there, you know what I saw? Yeah. I saw that. So I was able to share what Christ has done in the midst of death. Because death is never good. It doesn't matter how old, how young, how long the pain and suffering has been. Death is what? The consequence of sin and the enemy. Death is an enemy. Period, plain and simple. The Christ has conquered. This is next week's sermon. Okay? It is. It's Revelation chapter 1, holding the keys of death and hate. Provides the ways of escape, the psalmist writes. And then Jesus said, For the believe in me, even though they die, they shall live. They shall live. Because Christ has conquered death. Death is a reality that we all face. It's a reality that we experience when loved ones die. When people die. Just got word of a faithful saint back at, at Trinity. She's 98 years old. She would get up on the altar and hand clean the altar piece at 97. Victorious. And so, these talk about that more. You can study that in your own time. But who holds the victory over death and the grave? Christ our Lord. That's it. And what's the last enemy to be placed under Jesus' feet? It's death. 
It will come to completion. This is why the resurrection is so important. Because Christ is risen, so too shall we rise. Because Christ is risen, we've been given the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We hold the victory today. Thus, when the valley of the shadow of death comes, we can die in peace. Because death has no hold on us. This is why we say Christ is risen at funerals. I do that every great day. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. I love staring in that hole. Ah! You have no authority. Christ is coming. Okay. Pale horse. He will ride until Christ puts death under his feet. Here we go. Now this gets a little interesting. And he opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the soul of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. And they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow saints and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves have been. Okay. Saints who have been martyred, they're crying out. However, they've been given a white, white robe of righteousness and they're asked to rest a little longer. Because the grave is not complete. The grave is not the final resting place. Body and soul is not fully restored. And so they're crying out for that final thing to happen, for Christ to come and judge living and the dead. And so they wait. And even those who die in the Lord, they're resting from their labors, awaiting that great and glorious day. Judgment will take place on those who martyr the saints. That's not good. We pray for repentance. Okay. Uh, those who've been martyred have been clothed in Christ's righteousness and are at rest for the last day. What this tells us is that the church will be a suffering church. The church has been and will continue to be a suffering church. And even if martyrdom comes, what of it? There could very well be a day where the Lord asks me to die for the faith. And I will say, Amen. I believe this was quoted by uh, said of, uh, by Luther. He says, Let him cut my head off. He says, I know the one who can put it back. I believe it was Luther. <coughs> because we know that all things will be gathered on the last day. And we will rise to it. In fact, when you go through confirmation, what do, you, do you remember what you promised? Remain faithful unto death. That could be physical death, like Ailing body at 135,000 years old? I don't know. It's probably not that long. But however length of days the Lord gives, it could be old age. It may not. It could be other ways. It could be by martyrdom. Thanks be to God that Jesus holds the keys of death in me.
who are still here on earth, represent and illustrate the persecution and the suffering of the entire people of God, the Church of Jesus Christ. Now remember, this is all symbolism. So the saints, you know, altar, you know, I don't exactly know what that represents, okay, because I didn't read that in my in my reading. But this is what it says. Represent and illustrate the persecutions and sufferings of the entire people of God. Um, and the, well, another good Bible passage, the blood of evil speaks of that. So that's also in the scripture. Okay. The fifth seal, the church, comes into sight in its persecuting state, uh, suffering state. While the earthly oh, I keep losing my spot. While the earthly powers that be in the human race go their own way, pursuing their ambitions and goals, the suffering in the process, as illustrated by the four horsemen, the church follows the steps of the lamb that was slain. And because she does, she also suffers persecution and shame and death like that on a cross. The martyred saints of God then portray a picture of the suffering church all during the same period that the four horsemen are ravaging the earth from the time of the ascension of the of Christ to the end. For all Christians are martyrs in the sense that they all give witness by their faith, their mouths, their lives, to the victorious Lamb who died and rose. And because all Christians have uh, give that testimony, they all suffer because of it. They are all martyrs, holding to the faith, even to death. It is a glorious witness and song they give. So it's the song of crying out as we're longing for the Lord to come, but also those who have died in the faith already. Uh, and part of that song is to pray for each other, all to the glory of the one who is exalted on the throne. Um, in, it is in for glory to complete her mission in the martyrdom and thus glorify the cross and resurrection of Christ and his exalt, exaltation at the right hand of the heavenly Father. So, what I take this as is that the saints have died in the faith, martyred, they go be with Jesus, and they're with him in glory, singing and worshiping and waiting for the resurrection. Okay? And we too await that resurrection as well, singing and waiting and all that, even to persecution and Hope that makes a lot of sense. Yes. Thank you for that question. Because we cannot, if it smells of, we, we just can't go to purgatory because it's not there. <laughs> right? And if it smells like it, we need to get dry. Okay. <coughs> Let's continue reading. 12 through 17. Then he opened the sixth seal. I looked, and behold, there was a great... This, this is not... This is kind of scary. Okay? There was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as cloth. The full, uh, full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to earth, and the big tree shed its winter fruit, and when shaken by a gale, the sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place, then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For it is a great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Uh, ouch. Scary. Okay. And it comes the judgment of the living and the dead. Now remember, remind, remember, remember, in Revelation, there's like three or four, I can't remember how many I said, of these endings. Because we're not viewing it as a linear timeline. But there's a, it's cyclical, where you see these epics happen, end. And then we're going to get another round, and you're going to see it from a little different angle. Another one, boom. <coughs> another one, boom. Okay? And here we have the end. And there's a judgment. And people will be terrified by that. 
They will be. And it's kind of scary. <coughs> One seventy four. The opening of the sixth seal introduces John into the readers the first view of Revelation of the end of this world. And thus it concludes the first vision of events taking place on earth. The first sevenfold vision is one of horror, tribulation, suffering, and fear from the time of the Lord's resurrection and the ascension up to the end. The whole vision is nothing but woe and lament even for God's own people. Because we're not exempt from these things, right? We're not exempt from death. We're not exempt from famine. We're not exempt from governments doing goofy things. Okay? One can imagine that as John mystically experienced the horrors and sufferings depicted and saw at the conclusion only death in the grave and then finally the terrifying judgment of God, he might have been tempted to fall into a hopeless despair. O oh Lord, is this all that there is from now until the end? Even if your own people will suffer hard. John, of course, knew from his own experience that of his congregation, that suffering and final death would be their life. The Lord Christ, while still on earth, had told him as much. Okay? But what comes after this? Does this. Yes, John, there is suffering now. But remember that you have just seen and will experience all that tribulation and horror is not and will not be your end. Your end is to share in my exalted glory. Romans 8. You are my prophet who in the midst of your suffering speak of my glory as the victorious lamb and no matter what you suffer for my name's sake, I will defend you and keep you until I take you to myself. And thus, that's how we view it. Yes, it's scary. Yes, we'll experience it. But we need not fear. Because our end, our end is with Christ. And his victorious and that's what we're looking at next week. Because in this sevenfold seal, we get hope. And the hope is that there is no more hunger, neither shall there, the sun shall not strike you, nor any strike you be, for the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be there. And that's what we hold on to. That's what we cling to in these graves. Okay. I would suggest you go back and read these things. Okay? Because it really ties it all together. Because what John does, that it's all spoken in other places in Scripture. The four horsemen were spoken elsewhere in the Old Testament. In conclusion, it looks scary. The four horsemen raged the earth. People died. But we stand victorious with our Lord. <coughs> Thus, we continue as a church to do our job. To be the church. To love the Lord God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love our neighbor as ourselves. And as we do that, and more people come to know the sweet joy and the victory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, that there is hope in the midst of the scary things. We thank you, Lord God, that you have won victory for us. And so, Lord God, help your church stand as we cry out, as we sing, and yes, we even face persecution, we remain faithful unto the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. Next week, hope.